Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to sunny Southern California. We are live from Los Angeles here with Heroes of the Dorm. It is the Epic Eight Texas A&M currently down 0-1 against Arizona State University. And again, I got to say, unbelievably impressive play from Arizona State. And if for Texas A&M, you, you need to realize that you are the underdog going in here. A lot mm -hmm. of people did not actually pick them to even get this far in the fantasy bracket. So they have something to prove here. And going into game number two, I'm expecting it. You need to be a little bit more on point here. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you know statistically you're a little bit worse, it's no reason to get unconfident, uh, yeah. unsure about yourself. But it's totally okay for you. There's no onus on you to live up to any kind of expectations. <laughs> there should be little pressure. Sure, it's being broadcasted on ESPN yeah. three, but I mean, they can take some risks. Yep. One of the biggest pressures that the players are experiencing in this tournament is knowing the prizing that waits before them. Tim, tell us a little bit about what these players are competing Let's for. Let's talk about the prizing day nine. Yes, there are a number of things that our players will be getting. Anyone that is playing in the tournament will be getting free beta access and exclusive in-game portrait for uh, looking at one of our characters as Medan, so pretty cool to grab. The top 64 teams have get, have received a $40 battle.net balance, which means they can buy any Blizzard game, so sick, man. And of course, the top four teams will be getting an epic gaming system, uh, gonna be featuring uh, from CyberPair RPC featuring components from Intel, Gigabyte, and Rosewell, plus great hardware from HyperX and SteelSeries, and of course, the winning team, the biggest prize of it all, the tuition for college career. And that is quite the ramp up. You know, yeah. if you're down 0-1, <laughs> uh, again, at any level of competition, there's always that distracting feeling sure in your head where you start to think about things outside of the game. <laughs> Can't let that happen. Again, let's talk a little bit about Texas A&M, their lineup, what, what we think needs to go more right for them in the next game. Of course, go Sun on Zagara. I really think that the Zagara pick is going to have to be a little bit better controlled in the team fights. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 not like we're blaming it yeah, on go Sun or anything. Me. In the end, you you win and you lose as a team. Agreed. And in the end, the general team strategy is really what shines through there. So I can't imagine the kind of communications they must be having now. I hope for their sake, it's um, a lot about um, like, are we going to go back to our basics, our comfort level? And it's okay, we're behind and no pressure. Yeah, I agree with you there, Grubby. It doesn't, it's not really all in Gosan's uh, fourth there, but as a team, they need to decide to take a few more risks. And right here, uh, one of the players for the team near Elite, uh, from, he was born with actually 12 fingers, which is an odd, a different fact for him. Um, he did have surgery, I believe, to remove two of them, but is still playing. And of course, he's on top of point here when it comes to playing. So Team Maroon really showing off there with an amazing player like Team Leet. Yeah, and I especially like that, you know, it's, it's focused on the support players who honestly are the sort of hidden linchpin to many team compositions. Brightwing, yeah. just making sure Vala, Silvana stays alive just a little bit longer to get that extra killing blow. And of course, looking at Arizona State, we just see uh, excellent communication. Of course, I got to give a shout out to Melkor for studying applied mathematics. As a math major myself, my heart goes out to him. And of course, playing <laughs> the Lord of Terror, Diablo, my heart goes out to him twice. Yeah. That's so great. <laughs> yeah. I do want to shout out Kotenk as well. He's playing the uh, Force Wall Tassadar once again. And he was actually an unsung hero. He had a lot of, uh, we were talking about it in the break. He had a lot of Force Walls that allowed them to disengage and of course, do some awesome engages too. Yeah, sometimes I like to think of the supports as even though they may not have the most flashy uh, graphics in the way that they made their presence known, it's kind of like if the team constantly looks untouched, the support probably is doing some puppeteering <laughs> there and making sure that everyone is feeling happy, alive and well. The next map coming up is Cursed Hollow. Now on this battleground, the important thing is that it is a lot less about the team fights and a lot more about the objectives. There's gonna be a lot more opportunities for players to walk away from each other and set up the next big shove. So let's go ahead and take a look at the map. Grubby, tell us your thoughts on Cursed Hollow. Yeah, Cursed Hollow is a map with three lanes, and uh, that means that and there's also a big distance between the lanes. This means that players will need to choose heroes which are relatively mobile in order to get to those curses, collect all of three tributes to cast a powerful curse on the enemy team. And this will disable their fortifications and make you cut through their minions like a knife through butter. Bolster your attack with six mercenary camps. Anywhere from seeds, giants, or bruisers, or perhaps even enlist to your aid a grave golem. This will help you to push down the enemy fort, clinch ultimate victory, and see the opponent's core in shambles. 
it's going to be a much different consideration when building out the teams. Whereas team fighting is the norm on the previous battleground here on Cursed Hollow, often you'll have players roaming, not sticking in one particular position. You still have to consider the fact that when team fights do happen, they tend to go on for a very, very long time as it can be very difficult to deal with uh, capturing that tribute. And as expected, Jaina almost always a top pick. Yeah, she's great on this battleground when tributes do spawn, and you do actually want to fight around that area. So if she's there, you can totally bring the damage. We do have a follow-up here from Arizona State, though, as they're moving straight into Savannah and Vala. It was not a difficult decision for them, it seems. Yeah, you know, Very I, quick. I, Grubby, I actually want to ask you a little bit about this Sylvanas pick. I mean, it's coming out first for Arizona State, and I mean, Sylvanas has a very unusual set of abilities. Yeah, I mean, if left alone, Sylvanas is one of the most debilitating heroes against enemy fortifications. Um, she has that Black Arrows trait where every single time she does a basic attack, which is once per second, she can disable enemy uh, fortifications, towers, keeps, and make sure that they don't attack back. The same for every one of her primary abilities. And then not only does she have this pressure when left alone, but she can completely have a huge impact in battles with her heroic ability, the Wailing Arrow, a ranged spell that upon explosion at the enemy team will disable the use of all of their abilities for a short period of time. Yeah, and I mean, especially when there's a hero like Jaina, whose damage is based purely on abilities, getting silenced by Sylvanas' is tremendous. Tim, you know yeah, my favorite duo has just been chosen. <laughs> uh -huh. Day Nine's favorite combo to pull off in solo queue, it's going to be Diablo and Taronda. And teams with ultimate coordination can pull this thing off like crazy. It's like butter. They pick any hero they want, and they take them out immediately. And that puts them in a huge number advantage. So it's on the Diablo of the Toronto to make sure they're hitting their abilities. Now, what happens is that when Diablo charges in, he's going to do Shadow Charge and Overpower. If he gets disabled before he does his second ability, they could potentially foil this combination. Brightwing is picked. She could do exactly that. She's got the polymorph. Furthermore, we follow up with a strong frontliner and ETC there. <laughs> this is actually becoming a very annoying team from Dream Team. <laughs> I mean, Arizona State's mixture of disables is going to be massive. And Zagara Uther, love these choices. I mean, as many of you know, Zagara is one of my absolute favorite heroes in the game, but she's going to be an excellent lane bully. Yes! Uther and Jaina can hold in. And of course, Grubby, I hear a cheer from you about Hassadar. <laughs> Force wall. Force wall. <laughs> yeah, Arizona State seems to favor that heroic a lot. I do want to oh, mention, man. though, Zagara is actually a really strong pick against Sylvana. She's one of the few heroes that can actually 1v1 her very, very well, and in fact, win it. I would put it at about a 60 to 40 in lane, so um, a great pick up there. I think they may have wanted to stay away from Zagara after the first game, but noticing yeah. that Sylvanas is there, we have to go for it. Yeah, and I mean, the story of Texas A&M's composition in the early game is going to be a lot about Diablo and Taronda trying mm. to pick off an mm. enemy with a series of double stuns to finally eliminate. But I got to ask you, Tim, break down what Arizona State University's composition is all about. Arizona State's con uh, con or the entire composition is trying to get some kind of advantage early with Savannah. Get her into a lane, grab some turrets, get some experience for your uh, your entire team. And of course, she's actually a pretty solid brawler in the early game. If a tribute spawns near, Savannah can sneak on up and Ooh. be good to go in fighting. So we'll watch out for that and see if they can pull it off. Game number two is about to get started. The battleground will be Cursed Hollow. And there's a lot less team fighting early on. The split <laughs> is going to be very, very key. Would not be surprised to see Zagara soloing the bottom all by her lonesome self. And, you know, picking the top or the bottom for Zagara helps you avoid getting surprised. There's only one side to worry about. These are the types of considerations these players will make at the start of the game. Yeah, and we'll be seeing uh, potentially Sylvanas uh, be putting a lot of pressure on whatever map it is. It looks like it might be in the middle. It looks like they put three heroes there. Uh, Tassar are there for the shields, Brightwing with the healing, and if they, they, if they can, they want to grab a fort bear, or a keep or anything very, very early. It looks like it be, might be a turret. So we'll go ahead and check that out as we're going to see the fights occurring pretty darn soon. And it looks like actually Sylvanas is making her way down to the bottom with Vala. Yeah, we actually have a Zero Two here as well, who will be a great scout there to see if anyone in the middle team will be easy pickings. Now, what I'm going to be looking out for here in the early game is, is Arizona State University going to have a three lane with Sylvanas there? And is uh, Texas A&M going to leave that alone? Or are they going to roam in between lanes with Diablo Toronto? Well, looks like Diablo, Zeratul, and Taronda, known for their roaming on this map, actually all just hanging out and having a party in the mid lane, and Melkor is going to be very happy to see that. He can confirm for his team that there aren't any threats, but suddenly Zeratul's missing, and as we head down to the bottom lane, 
We see Noctis trying to find an opportunity to assault this trio. Uh, nice uh, talent, George, there by AKA Phase going with a scouting drone. We see that little scouting drone knocks it, takes it out, but that does mean that the attempt at a sabotage there of Arizona's plans has been foiled for now with that advance warning of the scouting drone. Nice job by AKA Phase. I do want to mention that these three heroes being down here are incredibly solid at pushing, but with uh, Jaina down there in the bottom left, Revenge using a hero that can actually burst through many ways pretty quickly with her Blizzard spell and the Cone of Cold, she actually deals with this lane pretty decently, and that buys time for Noctis, sees Aerotol to kind of flink around. A oh. little bit of a meeting here in the middle. Diablo charges in there, and Noctis near. There's four players from both teams here. Who's going to come out on top? Nier is going to get focused there by Melkor and Michael Udal. Taronda is an excellent hero at pickoffs, getting a little bit caught out of the way, but keep in mind, Taronda is one of the most fragile heroes in the game. If you're out of position just a little bit, you can easily die. Nearly manages to escape. And I mean, I think this tri-lane push is very, very interesting coming out of Arizona State. I do want to mention that I'm a little, I'm actually pretty happy these teams are so feisty. They were actually trying to hunt down Zeratul before they could jump between lanes. It's, it's pretty incredible yeah. how much Arizona wants to pick off some takedowns pretty early. Yeah, exactly. If you spread yourself thin over the castle walls, you may have a thin spread of defense at any point where the opponent tries to, to poke in and break down the walls. But they are actually meeting in the middle as an aggressive defense. Uh, they were. Now, soon we will be having a tribute spawn, and we're going to keep an eye on the mini-map here, as we'll be having it pretty soon here. We'll go ahead and pop it up when it does occur for you guys. Now, an absolutely critical thing to note about this map. You are trying to set up multi-pronged pressure. We see down in the bottom right, we see, see the siege, siege camps now beginning to move. And the goal is to align this right around the time that the tributes are spawning. This way, the enemy can't quite figure out what to deal with. Oh, very bad luck from Arizona State. It turns out the tribute is going to be arriving at the exact same time as the siege golems. Yeah, the because there's kind of a random element to where the first tribute spawns. Now it will spawn at the bottom, which will make it easier for Texas A&M to both clear up the siege giants and continue to interrupt the capture of the tribute of Arizona State University. This Look. is where the never-ending team fights can begin. We see Melkor trying to step in. Noctis just going to poke him off. Now it's Nier's turn to try to deal a little bit of damage. Uh, I mean, this is exactly where Diablo needs to begin to get some pickoffs to get the advantage. Do you want to mention that Tassadar is actually on the top lane? So this is a 5v4 situation. So watch for the uh, blue team to potentially get this tribute. The red team will try and poke it down. Oh, nice uh, cancellation there by Michael Uda with the multi shot with extra range, getting near lead there. Melkor's job now. Uh, Fam is trying to interrupt as well. Keep in mind, any time purchase here with no heroes dying is a great situation for ASU, but they will lose Brightwing there. You gotta be careful, man. You can't be losing heroes wow. here. And two go down, day nine. Oh, Melkor as well. Okay, okay. Well, they were trying to just buy time and keep a status quo even there with the four versus five. Tassadar not coming in. He's gaining experience points there. It's not like he's selfish <laughs> and says, I don't want to help you guys. There was a real strategic element. But because they lost the two heroes, as the situation would have it, exactly identical experience on both teams. And they reach level seven in unison. Yeah, everything's a cost-benefit analysis. We see two kills to none. But again, tied at 7-7, seven, seven, and one of the great things that Kotank has going is those turrets are now out of ammo. They can't defend upcoming waves of minions, and this might be a very good opportunity to try to push a little more aggressively, but no, Noctis says, okay, Kotank, that's enough. You're going to get knocked back. The roaming continues from Texas A&M. Now, keep in mind that you need to capture all three tributes to fulfill a curse for your team. And you could go up to two out of three, and the enemy could have two out of three. So it doesn't mean necessarily there will be a curse soon. The first tribute, in essence, it doesn't do anything yet until you have more. But it doesn't mean it's without value, of course, as you are one step closer to that. So that's something that Texas A&M has already. So you could say that they have a small lead here. The underdog has a small but yeah, significant lead. Oh, I love this. Perfect timing. The Bruiser camps are moving out at the exact same time as the tribute in different regions. Yeah, exactly. Those multi-pronged attacks that you were talking about, Day9. Now, those bruisers, either they have to be dealt with or they will do damage and fire off with impunity in that middle lane against the blue fortifications. Bam, getting flipped over the shoulder, will get taken down. Nice follow up there by Team Texas A&M. Texas A&M are getting a nice amount of takedowns early in this game compared to what we saw on the last uh, uh, the last battleground. Uh, 
Tomb of the Spider Queen. On Cursed Hollow, this seems to be their battleground. They are unison here when it comes to actually moving around the map. Great mobility overall. And they're also keeping up in experience. In fact, they're about to be level 9 like their opponents. And the Bruiser Camp didn't do any damage in the middle lane. They finished it off. They wrapped it up quickly enough. Got a takedown. Very cleanly got that tribute. Level 9 versus level 9, but they are two ahead in the tribute. And now they will be looking to get a Bruiser Camp themselves in the bottom left of the map, trying to do to Arizona State as they have done onto them. I mean, really, Texas A&M has been playing a little bit pokey. They've been trying to stay together, and we see that that's part of the reason why they're a little bit behind on experience. But my god, being able to get three tributes this early. I mean, there has been virtually zero resistance from Arizona State. The composition of Texas and A&M is excellent for fights around tributes. And yet again, we're starting to see more encampment setups. Arizona State sending the Siege down. Texas A&M sending the Bruisers down. This next tribute, both teams have their heroic abilities. This is going to be the most important tribute fight of the game thus far. And it's currently up here in the top right corner as we're heading to that location. And you'll probably see the entire blue team, Texas A&M, head down to this tribute if they can secure it. As oh. you mentioned, the curse will come up. Void Prison, Apocalypse follow up. One stun on Melkor. He's not the primary target, but he's still a target. They're going to be focusing down here there with Jaina using the abilities, but a Wailing Arrow prevents her from using her entire uh, Frost Arrow. <laughs> oh, wall. Michael Udal gets taken down. Thrown over the wall, Gosun tries to retreat, continuing to try to help. Don't kill me, Kay. I'm falling to the bottom, but of course the tribute lingering while this entire team fight goes on. Melkor leading the fight to Ronda. Lunar Flare right in the midst oh, of that very tight hallway. Force Wall. Force Wall doing a great job of zoning out Diablo, but he has so much health. Don't kill me, Kay. Easily stays alive. Now the red team, Arizona State here, they're buying time, even as they're trying to get a pick off on Ghost Sun in a four versus five situation for Vala to come back. She's back. She'll be here in five seconds. The health pool on Arizona State is looking very, very healthy, and they have successfully extracted themselves from a very difficult situation and managed to actually capture this tribute. Oh my god, and they were funneling through such a <laughs> tight point. I mean, it's so easy for blizzards, for lunar flares, for the apocalypse. I mean, even though it was gone, the theme of the entire Texas A&M team works amazingly in those tight corridors. And really quickly, why the blue team gave up that tribute is because they were being forced into a team fight that they didn't think they could win because they've already wasted their heroics, but they also had pressure down here in this bottom lane as we had the entire lane being pushed by Seed Giant. So they decided we have to go down there and defend that, but it looks like we're going to make a fight in the very far top right corner here as a golem is being grabbed by the red team. Now that Lunar Flare hit two people, Divine Storm follow-up hits two or three as well. Everyone is still alive, but they're dropping low. <gasps> they got the gra Grave Golem, but actually red team, Arizona State, will get the first takedown. Well, it looks like Tassadar's force wall is finally not going to help him stay alive. It is a two for two exchange. The boss pushing the entire time. Absolutely, Arizona State got the best of that deal. I mean, early on in the game, we talked about how important it was that Tassadar had removed the ammo from these turrets by this pressure. And now, as we see the boss, the golem pushing the top lane, very little basic fortifications are there to defend it. And the tribute is up at the far south side of the map. Yep, down here in the bottom left corner, you see the Tribute spawning. Team are going to have to go down here and grab that bad boy. And you're going to see them going down there in a couple of seconds. As the red team, though, has a better footing as it looks like uh, Vala's on the way. But Noctis already here, the sneaky Zeratul, might get the Tribute. And that's the third Tribute, now a curse here. Okay, this curse will, ha will last for 1 minute and 10 seconds. During this time, none of the Arizona State fortifications will be aiding in the defense against enemy lane minions, mercenaries, and heroes. So this is a very important time. Anything could happen here. During this momentous period, if you haven't seen the last Super 16 last week, anything from none to three forts have died during such a time. So let's see what Texas A&M can get out of this as they start the Void Prison. And is the Apocalypse combo going to work? It manages to deal a good amount of damage, but we're seeing Diablo get very low after the oh. attempted overpower. The Starfall lands right in the middle, managing to deal massive damage, but Kotank, Michael Udall, manages both to stay alive despite falling very low. We're seeing again the wall not quite a, a, causing a huge kill, but allowing a safe disengagement. Now, Day9, uh, all five heroic abilities were used by Texas A&M. They needed this fight to go well, 
but they didn't get any takedowns. Only two to three heroics were used for Arizona State University, and they got up four of them. In the next 40 seconds, Arizona State so could stage a team fight where they've got four heroic abilities against none. That means that what Texas A&M is doing now, the Grave Golem, is fraught with extreme risk. If in the next 10 seconds, Arizona State catches wind of this and they come in here, the backstab could be huge. But we're seeing Melkor kind of there by himself. No one else is there, gets tossed overhead. The series of stuns not going to be enough. Lunar Flare tries to land on Fam. Sylvanas, now the target goes on, trying to retreat. We're seeing Revenge get extremely low. The shield does manage to keep her alive a little bit longer. It's all disengagement right now from Texas A&M. They're pulling back, and now oh Revenge. Oh my gosh. Oh. Once again, the Diablo gets taken down. Revenge, somehow, three times, was kept alive by Gosan, but eventually Melkor jumps in, uses his stage dive, and Gosan should follow soon. Three takedowns for Arizona State. It's what we were talking about there. They had all their heroics up, and they used it here to get those three takedowns. Yeah, you gotta be careful in scenarios like that. You, they were trying to sneak a golem. They were caught by the red team, but when you're missing those two heroics, it's important for you to make sure that you pull back and not force an engagement. This comp is very wombo combo s. They wanna lay their heroics on top of each other and apply the damage. And you're right, Grubby, without having those heroics, they're in such a pain, and now they're paying for it here in terms of experience with Arizona State now ahead at 15 to 13. I gotta say, Grubby, you talked about this before the broadcast cast began the force walls from Kotank. I honestly think Texas A&M is a little flabbergasted. Like, how do you <laughs> prepare against that? The fact that there is so much uh, uh, region between the lanes with tight chokes makes the force wall have so much more effectiveness than on other battlegrounds. So here, the shove towards mid, bams, using Sylvanas so well to disable those turrets to prevent any damage to the rest of her team. I do want to mention really quickly here that the red team is in such a good position. They have pressure in the bottom lane. They have pressure in the middle lane, pressure in the top lane. They have all five members currently here in the middle, while the blue team has three members down here in the bottom left corner. They legitimately cannot hold anything at the moment, and you see Arizona State taking this advantage and really just spiraling it out of control. Now, in equal game states, you could both be taking your own mercenary camps, but it's got to the point where Arizona State University is aggressively stealing away enemy siege giant camps while holding off the blue team there. Oh, Gosan wow. and Noctis get caught on the wrong side of a force wall. No major follow-up yet. Wailing arrow down, Gosan. He gets down without being able to do anything. And and he's down. They actually desync there on the heroics. <laughs> we yeah. had the apocalypse from Diablo go down in an incorrect time. The Void Prison followed up and actually negated the entire thing. It was crisis management. They tried to keep the heroes alive. Only one got taken down there, but uh, oh man, yeah, that was a little bit of a crisis management, a little bit of jittery. Yeah, that is one of the most stressful and most difficult mistakes to come back from. When you know you and an ally had to coordinate heroic abilities, that was Zeratul and Diablo needing to get the same, uh, to get the right lineup. And as we're seeing, Arizona State is taking all the minion encampments on the map. There's, there's less specific timings that are associated with this and more just denial of any future move from Texas A&M. Yeah, exactly. And now, even though Texas A&M had such a great start there, uh, day nine, two out of three tributes, uh, equal hero levels, more takedowns. Now they find themselves once again, it's like, hey, we didn't want to be here in, on the back foot here and just uh, passively awaiting anything that our opponents throw at us. My question to you guys is, we're currently behind if you're Texas A&M. As a Texas A&M fan, what do I want to see from this blue team? What do they have to do to get into a scenario where they can win the game? Well, you need to start predicting your enemy's movements before they even think of it. Who have a good the overview the of the map objectives. Where do we think the next tribute is going to spawn? Uh, where are the remaining mercenary encampments that the opponent could go for? We see some splitting being liberally done by Arizona State University. They've got to be on top of them. They've got to lay some uh, booby traps here for the opponent and make sure that it's not always a fair 5v5, that it's a 5v4 or 5v1. Well, Texas A&M is in position. Almost all the minion encampments on the map are, take, are taken. This is really the only opportunity for Texas A&M. And we see, oh my god, Melkor with the stage dive. And suddenly Melkor is caught a little bit off angle. We're seeing Noctis. We're seeing Ghost Sun far forward. The health bar on Ghost Sun is getting so low. Uther gone, but Given his trait, he's going to be able to stay alive a little bit longer, and suddenly it looks like Arizona State, second to the tribute, but likely going to be the ones that pick it up. And how many heroes will they take down here? One got taken down, a second one there in Taranda. Will Don't Kill Me K make it out? Well, he has no escape, so the answer is no. 
They are feeling so confident right now. Arizona State, in terms of coordination and being on point, are really just there right now. They didn't lose a single member in that entire team fight. Um, the blue team, Texas A&M, lost three members here, and now they're getting a goal. They're even waiting for the tribute up here in the top left corner. If you notice, it actually has not been grabbed yet. They're waiting to grab the goal so they get the added pressure of the goal pushing and the entire curse. They're kind of double dipping here. That's a great point. I mean, one of the worst ways to take advantage of the tribute is to go for camps after you get it. But but coordinating them at the same time, there's almost no good decision you can make as Texas A&M of how to distribute. And it looks like, given the fact that Arizona State is continuing to move towards the top, oh, revenge, Ooh. knocked his ghost son, trying to it. get an ambush. This, this is, is what the they need, but he goes in too soon. Force wall is an easy disengage solution there. Kotank uh, making sure that they cannot get caught out there. That was actually the kind of moves that they need to rely on. Yeah. Now, curse still 40 seconds. Boss is starting to push in. Keep won't defend. So there's actually an aggressive advantage here for ASU. No defenses, and the Golem will slam down every now and then, stunning everyone around it. So they're making use of it. There's only three members up here in the top left corner. If you look at the mini map really quickly, there's two in the bottom left. So you see Arizona State forcing the issue here, pushing for this keep, going to grab that experience, get themselves a little bit further ahead. And the entire blue team, Texas A&M, needs to defend. But the problem is they're defending the middle. They're defending the bottom. But now this is the crucial point. They have to come up here, and they have to defend this push. Void Prison, will the Apocalypse come back in time? Actually, it may not matter. One takedown already. Apocalypse misses uh, the Void Prison there as uh, Zero Tool is already down. He couldn't cancel that Void Prison. Don't kill me, K charges in there, but the boss is still hammering away. Only 70% life left on the core at this point. This looks to be it. I mean, Arizona State going for extra kills, extra gravy on top. The undefeated team continues their undefeated streak. Kotank continues his absolute endless stream of walls throughout the game. And oh. I mean, what a better map to choose than Curse Hollow. That was just a solid start to finish. And you know, when you look at Arizona State University, especially in you know the first eight, 10 minutes of the game, there was really no big flashy move. It was that every time you looked at the experience bar, they seemed to be ahead. They kept staying ahead. Everything they did was subtle, and it locked in right when the pushing began. All the towers had no uh, no ammunition on them. And uh, speaking of experience, Day9, as a famous uh, golf coach once said, he said, the lead doesn't matter. I mean, we had what we call the underdogs. They're not the rookies, but the underdogs here in Texas A&M, they had a good lead. Uh, but the experienced team, the one that has that now 22-0 record, was able to just find exactly what they needed to do. They calmly deconstructed Texas yeah. A&M there. Valiantly fought by Texas A&M, but they tried to climb one mountain too high there in Team ASU. Yeah, I agree. ASU was just composed there the entire time. And in the middle late game, you saw Texas A&M. They had a great early game. Once again, just like in the first map, when they went to the mid game, they were missing their combos. They were having heroics go off left and right that were untimed correctly. And you saw the Arizona State University start preying on that. And that's why right now they are 22-0. and Can't wait to see them in the Epic 8. I mean, that solid coordination means that we are going to see Arizona State University live next Sunday at the Shrine Auditorium for the grand final. They are going to make it all the way to the top four for a chance to win the grand prize of being able to have free tuition for their college career. Ladies and gentlemen, coming up next is going to be Boston College versus the University of Western Ontario. Stay tuned. Check out heroesofthedorm.com for all the updates, and we'll be seeing you shortly for the next match.